when I got this P1. There are people that told me, you rebuild it back to stock because you're gonna harm the resale value. I'm like, the fucking flood did that. <laughs> Freddy, AKA Tavon. Man, this guy finds Project Car Gold. My name is Freddy Hernandez. I go by the moniker Tabarish. Over 2.7 million subscribers. Back then, each video was getting 100,000 views. I went from 150,000 subscribers to like 550 in the span of a few months. And I was like, holy crap, this is, this is awesome. How many people does it actually take to run your channel? Uh, it's me. All the editing? Yeah. It's all you? It's all me. Oh, now that really does surprise me. What's interesting is, um, uh, maybe this is a little controversial, little spicy take here. That's fucked up, yeah. man. And, I got, <laughs> yeah. and at the start of the year, you post a video saying you couldn't do this anymore? My marriage uh, ended. It, it changed my understanding of like mental health because for a very long time, I wasn't happy. It was just everything kind of like crashing down for me. I don't feel like I deserve any of the stuff that I'm getting. How big of a decision was it to purchase an AP1? I had to get a loan for that amount of money. And then I told the bank exactly what I was going to do with that money. I told them, hey, there's this car that's, that's been floating down the street. I want to buy it and it doesn't run and it's very expensive. And they were like, Freddy Tavarish, most of our subscriber base, no doubt, will already know who you are, especially if they followed since the Matt Armstrong episodes of Misha, because we notice a lot of people watch your content too. But there'll also be viewers coming in from your platform. But for anybody that might not know, who are you in your own words and what do you do? I make YouTube videos about cars. <laughs> Any cars in particular? <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, we got like the, uh, we got fast ones and sometimes they're blue. So those fast okay, no, blue I, I'm, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not, I'm just being facetious here. Uh, so my, my name is Freddie Hernandez. Uh, I go by the moniker Tabarish. Um, and I build, I, I sort of, sort of rebuild, modify and, uh, do interesting stuff with uh, uh, supercars, uh, exotic sports cars, and sometimes crappy cars, just anything that strikes my fancy. So I am a, a car guy at heart. And, um, you know, I've been doing this full time for about uh, five, six years. And that full time for five or six years has built up a subscriber base of over 2.7 million subscribers. Actually, I want to I want to correct you there. Two point six six. Yeah, it's like two point six eight or two point six nine. Nice. Yeah, but by the time the video goes out. How? I mean, come on, we're thinking in a head here in oh, a few okay, days. Okay, 3.2 million subscribers. <laughs> yeah. But 427 million views. I believe I checked that one this morning. Okay. Uh, and over 318,000 followers on Instagram. When I say those numbers over, say, a five year period, how does that make you feel? I don't. So it's weird because, like, the. The numbers are just numbers to me. Like it, it, they never become real. It's like if you have a business that's online only, and then you like you get a paycheck from that business and it goes directly into your bank account. Like none of that stuff is actually real. But it's like if you go to the you know the 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 ATM and you take out some money and you go, oh, I have I have money in my pocket, or like I I, I can see this becomes tangible. Like then becomes real. So when you go to a uh, an event like Goodwood or uh, Shed Fest or Petrol Hedonism and you see a bunch of people that come and see you and they say, hey, you got me through something, or I've been watching you for years or whatever, then that becomes real and that becomes like a little like I don't know. I I get imposter syndrome, you know, because of this. But like um, I always think of myself as just some guy. And it's just, you know, these numbers don't mean anything until they do, if that makes any sense. Do you think it's because that's when you're kind of head down inside the workshop? It's the same workshop that you've been in for a while from when you would have had, I don't know, a million subscribers or a hundred thousand subscribers versus where you are now. So it's always the same surroundings, but yet the numbers are just getting bigger on the outside. So you only seem to notice when you go to these shows and stuff then. Yeah, because I mean, it's just you and a camera and then that camera is attached to, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of people. So, you know, when I put a video out, I look at the little numbers, the, the view counts going up and I go, neat. But then, you know, I, I don't see any real, you know, th there's no difference in my life because of it. So I, I, I don't know. It's, it's just like, you know, this weird thing where if 
if I was a musical act that went on stage and I performed in front of people, you would have an immediate reaction with like a sea of people. So you go, oh, okay, I get it. But like with YouTube, you don't have that. So it's like, there's a really big disconnect between, you know, right now it's just me, you, and- uh, Old he, Steve. Is he, is, he on, is he asleep right now? <laughs> You're like checking your phone, like, what, what, what? <laughs> Bold Steve is alive. Okay, me, you, and the surface of the sun right here. <laughs> and um, yeah, and like, it's just us talking, but like this goes out and then reaches so many people. And you know, that just sort of becomes real when those people start to interact with you. Like when you're going into an airport and then people go, Hey, I know you're from YouTube. And you just mentioned a minute ago that you've been, I know. Um, it's 2.69 million. It's 2.69 million. <laughs> nice. So I reckon it will be 2.7 when it goes out. But yeah. you, you mentioned that you've been doing YouTube five to six years a minute ago. Mm -hmm. So from here, I can see that you actually joined in 2006. Yeah. Do you remember, and I have got it here, the first video you ever posted to YouTube? Uh, Yeah, and it wasn't the one that you have. Oh, Be because, okay. Because I have unlisted quite a quite a few <laughs> right. quite a few videos because it's just like the pure shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like it's like me doodling on a guitar or something like that. Like in 2006, that was just it was just a a place for me to put some videos. Uh, I think the first video I have is maybe like my car trying to start or something. Yeah, what car do you think that was? It's a Nissan Maxima, I know. And, yeah, yeah, well done. Yeah, absolutely. I know my first car now. is, yeah. <laughs> Nissan Maxima, cold start issue. Mm -hmm. And that was 17 years ago. Okay, so how many views did I get? That I didn't write down. <laughs> okay, well, well, there you go. There you go. Okay, uh, so what's interesting is... Um, uh, maybe this is a little controversial, a little spicy take here. Uh, but I got introduced to a fetish because of that because of that video. So I I put out that video, and then I got a bunch of weird requests because of it. Uh, and it's because there's a fetish online, and I had to look it up. It's called pedal pushing, and that people get aroused when you push a pedal with your foot. Uh, and then because my my car was trying to start, I was trying to give it some gas, and people are like, "Can you can you can you show me your feet?" Like it's it's like a it's like a it's like a foot thing. That's fucked up, yeah. man. <laughs> and I got yeah, and I got uh, I got emails because of it. Um, and they were like, hey, you know your your video is really good. Can I uh, can you just can you just try to start your car, but just like put point the camera down at your feet? And I'm like, okay, can you give me like some money or something? <laughs> no, oh, are you looking? At my, am I? Are you one of the people? They're not as big as I thought. Oh, you know that that's what. That's what they all say. <laughs> <laughs> if that ain't, if that if ain't I had a, a nickel for every time, all if right. that ain't a YouTube short, I don't know who yeah, yeah, is right yeah, there. Yeah, there you go. But what? So how old would you have been back in the pedal pushing days? <laughs> back when I was big, big in the pedal pushing community. Um. Uh geez, this would have been what? Oh six, oh six, oh seven. So I was born in eighty seven, and I can't do math right now because my brain is full of steak. So I don't know. So in your thirties now. Yeah, I'm in, I'm 36. There we go. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So 19. 19. There we go. I was 19. Okay. It's we're going to win. I was gonna... in foundation maths. <laughs> oh, good. Good. So I usually blame the American school system, but yeah, you can't, I can't say that here. Yeah. No, yeah. I was, the, I was basically that because that was 17 years ago. How many cars do you have and how much do they, how much do they cost? Too many at the minute and I'm a bit stressed about it. Okay. <laughs> Everybody. Don't stay in school. It's a waste of time. Uh, yeah, I suppose. <laughs> but <laughs> your A levels don't mean anything. <laughs> you can buy a flood damaged. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's that's right. Yeah, we're but, uh, we're proof positive that you can't do basic math and you can get these cars. So it's it's fine. Which brings me on perfectly to up to that point of your first ever YouTube video going out. What was life like growing up as a kid? Who who were you as a kid? What what did life bake you as like? What did it make you when you were growing up? What was the things around you? Okay. What was your family? Uh, quick, quick. Uh, did you like cars? Oh, I loved cars. Uh, so I uh, came to this country when I was three. My parents came over from the Soviet Union. My uh, dad was from Dominican Republic. My mom was from Russia. I was born in Russia, so essentially a Soviet Union. Um, and when I say this country, I mean the US. I forget where we are, so we're I'm sorry. We're in a van in the back of the yeah. Miller and Carter yeah, in yeah, Manchester. We, we, we are literally in a car park in, the, in, in Manchester right now. So uh, I, I moved to the US when I was three. And, uh, you know, I was always interested in cars ever since I can remember. I had little toy cars. I, I built Legos. I loved planes, trains, everything like that. Um, and 
Uh, then I just uh, graduated into, you know, the first car I had was a, a Nissan Maxima. Now I wanted to to do something with it, so I started tinkering with it. I started, you know, changing the tail lights and putting in a stereo. The first thing I did was, um, you know, do a manual conversion on the car uh, with a, a cheap set of tools, and uh, just went from there. But like as a kid, I always knew that I wanted to do something with cars because it's they, they were they were interesting to me. You know, like they they were. Um, you know, I didn't know it then, but it was a very human experience. You know, it was a very like human thing. Uh, you'd have individuality with cars. You know, you, had, you have different designs, you have uh, different engine notes, you had like different specs. And like, it's, I just really appealed to me for some reason. I don't know, maybe there's something innate in my nature. So but... it wasn't like um, your dad was an absolute car freak or anything like that. It just aspired to you. No, uh, both of my parents could not give a crap about cars. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm still, the, I'm... No, still no interest to know? No, they don't care. <laughs> no, they're they're not. I mean, they support me and everything. Yeah, they're they're, they're great. But uh, yeah, they don't care. You know, it's uh, it's like the Jeff Foxworthy bit. It's like if you ever see my legs, uh, you know, come out from underneath the car, please send help because something horrible has happened. <laughs> <laughs> so you got into this Nissan Ma Maxima, which was the first public video that you can look back to on your YouTube channel. I bet you're going to get rid of that now. So it looks I'm like not going to get rid of it. No, no, that, no, no. So, Just to spite you. Yeah, I will. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The one with the cold start issue. Uh -huh. but, so that is on your YouTube channel. Was it always called Tavarish and where did that name come from? Uh, it wasn't always called Tavarish. I actually started my YouTube channel. Um, it might have been, I, I changed it to something called, oh, look at that. You are, you are skating on thin ice there, buddy. Yeah. So uh, it was called uh, Apita Online, and uh, I I had the idea to make a website, uh, much like you know you uh, you make websites. Um, so I wanted to make a website uh, that was like a knowledge hub for car people. So it would be you know let's say you know you look up what's a popular car here. Christ, um, mid range value. Just what, what, I mean, literally. I don't whatever. know, Audi RS3. Okay, Audi RS3. So you look up Audi RS3 in uh, in my database and like, uh, it would be like the Wikipedia article. It would be, um, you know, common faults. It would be like, hey, you can find a few mechanics in your area here. Here's some how to's and stuff like that. That's the idea I had in my head for this website that I called APIDA Online. Uh, and APIDA was uh, APIDA, what's um, Automotive Performance Index Database and Answers. And I thought that was really really kind of you know that was really stay in school yeah that, that was that was really <laughs> clever and it never went anywhere because uh as you can imagine uh the legwork that it takes to put all those things together is impossible for for one person uh i thought about crowdsourcing and then i'm like well how do i how do i do this without people like claiming that this stuff is theirs and like how do i know that you know people are really putting their stuff and not stealing stuff so i'm like this is just a, a giant you know cluster so uh but i kept it on uh, the youtube channel so apita online was going to be uh, a bunch of how to's uh, i actually had a podcast type thing that i called off track uh that me and another person would be in a car and we just talk and i would put out little 10 minute segments uh, and this was a few weeks ago a few weeks ago, a few years ago um actually several years ago now since uh you know i've been doing this Tavares thing for five, six years. Uh, but then I just turned it to uh, Tavares because Tavares means uh, comrade or friend uh, in Russian. And uh, I spelt it differently because uh, the, 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 the phonetical, the phonetic um, spelling of Tavares would be T-O-V-A-R-I-S-C-H. Uh, and I was like, I'm going to make it a little bit different. Tavares is something I came up with when I was 12 as a screen name. Couldn't think of anything more clever. So there it is. It's kind of like Shmi 150. So there you go. Because I think a lot of business owners out there, and I've definitely been in this position before, so many people sit down and try and find a name for their company. And when they actually sit there with a notepad and pen and they're determined to find that name for a brand or a company or whatever, it will never, ever come to them on no. time. They can't do it. And it, it just comes... I got the name for my previous paving business because a lorry got stuck on the corner outside mm -hmm. our local pub yeah. and it said sports direct. And I thought, Hey, that's a good name. So mm -hmm. I'll call it paving direct. But like you see these really obscure names out there, just like that. You think how the hell did that person, mm -hmm. but there's actually proper meaning behind it from when you were younger. Well, seems a bit. I mean, I don't think there's any meaning behind it. I, I, I just think like, Hey, why not? Why not do this? It's, it's fine. It's not like I had any brand recognition or, you know, like nobody knew who I was, but uh, I just thought, okay, I can do this. And, you know, like, because people look at it and go, what, what's a, what's a Tavarish? Is that, is that English? Like that's, that's, what does that mean? That doesn't mean anything. So 
you mentioned then you were uploading some videos years ago, as you said, and fiddling around with cars, but YouTube, which is obviously what you do now and you make the source of income, et cetera. That wasn't like that back then. So take us through where you started, where you worked mm -hmm. and, and what you did up to the point of having your own channel. So um, when I had, when I started my channel, I was working for a, a website, a blog, a car blog called Jalopnik. And Jalopnik was the biggest uh, car blog in essentially in the world. Uh, and I got there only because I would write, I, I had apitaonline.com and I would write my articles on there uh, because I would buy and try to modify and flip cars, uh, you know, just like cars that I, I found interesting, but also like it's cheap crap that I could just, that, that only I could afford. So um, I started writing up these articles and then I, uh, I started writing for Jalopnik because I posted my articles on their open forum called Opposite Lock. And then, uh, then I wrote an open letter to the editor in chief. And then um, basically through, you know, whatever, whatever car gods shined upon me, uh, they said that they had a little bit of budget. Uh, it was like 500 bucks a month. And then... Uh, I, I wrote there, uh, it was with, um, you know, one of the people that was, uh, uh, working alongside me was Doug DeMiro okay, and, cool. uh, and Doug DeMiro was doing some stuff on YouTube and he was getting, you know, some views and I was like, oh, that's, that's really cool. I think I can do that too. So, you know, based on that, then I was like, all right, well, what can I do? Cause you know, Doug's doing his shtick with, you know, I bought a Ferrari and it's a pile of crap and, you know, I can't believe I wasted this. And like, I have a, uh, you know, a Land Rover that, uh, that has a bumper to bumper warranty. That was a big thing. Bumper to bumper. Uh, but for me, I was like, I work on cars, so I want to see what I can do, uh, in this space. So then I just started kind of doing that and, you know, bounced around with different formats. So is that where you got the idea, just taking it slightly back to actually do your own website with all the, was that your first sort of digital experience? Because as I say, m most people don't hit the nail, the ground running the first time they try something and it, and it works every time I've had things that have failed. And you said yourself, you've set up that car site back in the day. But it seems to me a common theme that a lot of the guys that I speak to that are from a kind of YouTube background as their mm -hmm. main business with stuff around it have always tried something kind of digitally or slightly digitally minded. Yeah. So is that where you got your experience, say, with that? to try and launch your own car Wikipedia site? Yeah. So the, the, the reason I, I did the car website is because, uh, I originally, I did work for people, uh, in my parents' driveway. Like, so I would do work for people on the forums and the forums, uh, for the, for, for everybody that's watching that doesn't know what a forum is. Uh, it's what happened before Facebook groups. Um, so, uh, it was like the Nissan forums, infinity. Do you guys have infinity over here? Uh, I know what you're on about. Well, it's it's like a, it's like us, a fancy us Nissan. Guys that are watching the podcast will know what you're on about. When you it's say a fancy Infinity. Nissan. Yeah. Okay. So and the Lexus. Do you guys have Lexus over here? Yeah. Okay. So like yeah. Um. So just just those things, and uh, I would do work for like thankless work, like you know a suspension install for eighty bucks or something, or like an engine install for six hundred, and uh, you know things like that. And then I I thought I could do a mobile auto modification business. I was like, I can have a van just like this. I can put an air compressor. I could have it outfitted with tools. And then I would go to people and do their mods, you know, and I could do suspension installs. I could do repairs, all that stuff. And I quickly realized that it's, uh, that would be a terrible idea because what happens if I got hurt? What happens if I screw somebody's car up? And it's not a, it's not a idea that's scalable, you know? So it's like, all right, I have this one van. How much work can I do in a day? You know, like, am I... You're closing yourself off. Exactly. I'm closing myself off. So I'm, I'm thinking, oh, I'll have more vans. I'll have this and that. And then I thought, like, I don't I, I don't want to do this. But what would, you know, would people, would people warm up to it if it was something online? So then I thought, okay, what if I make a website where I charge people money for, like, uh, answering their car questions? And then I thought, like, well, I'm not really a, a seasoned mechanic. I've never... You know, I, I don't have any training in this. So why would people give a crap? So then I, I, I just uh, decided to write my own articles. And then I thought uh, I can um, try to get people onto my site and make money like that through AdSense. Okay. So what I did was... That was quite big 10 years ago or so. I remember when I was growing up that it was like, if you've got a, some sort of blog or a website, you'd see ads down the left, down the right, underneath yes. it, above it, everywhere. Yeah. I mean, you see that now. Now it's like every website has like, you, you just go on a website for the news and you get 50 ads. Like it's, it's insane. Um, but back then I didn't know what I was doing. 
So I started writing these articles, put put ads where I thought they should go. And then I thought like, and I was like, why, why aren't people coming to my site? Uh, so then I joined 400 Facebook groups and literally every Facebook group with a car I joined like around the world. And every time I had an article out, I would post it on every single Facebook group. And it took me hours and hours and hours and I would engage with people. And then overnight, you know, I would have like a thousand views. I'm like, Oh my God, that's a thousand views. A thousand. Yeah. To about a thousand. Yeah. Yeah, it's quite is a big it, milestone, yeah, is isn't it? Is that a significant number for you? Yeah, it is a significant it's, number to me. Oh, look at that. You got a, a, a little, we little have, you got a plaque. I've got a little plaque back there. Yeah. Is that plaque see-through? <laughs> Can you see through that? Yeah. <laughs> Did you make that in marker? Is, so this this is my plaque that they both took the mick out of me for and they come on here, which That's was wonderful. I bought for myself for passing the first thousand subscribers let me see, to the let me podcast, see this. Let me see this. which was about a month ago. We're going to plant this um, right here. We're now on six and this a half is gonna, thousand. This is going to be right here for the entirety of this podcast. Uh, so, Hopefully so, it grows another zero at the end of this podcast. At, at the beginning, right? That would be helpful. Zero, so if that's 1, 000, not yeah. a cue to say, please hit the fucking subscribe button, yeah. I don't know what is because I want a different plaque that's got a bigger number on it than that. You want one that YouTube actually sends you? <laughs> yes. Okay, okay, good, good, good. good. Yeah, that's yeah, the that, only that, reason that, I've spent the money on this van. That, that, that's good. Uh, no, I, I, I wish you continued success and anybody <laughs> watching right now, you should definitely subscribe to this because uh, they have really good stuff. So um, yeah, I, I just went to Facebook groups and I posted everything I spammed, you know, like a spam posted. And then uh, based on that, I, I, I sort of had an idea of how to get an audience a little bit because I had I had feedback, but it was like in 400 different places. But uh, what Jalopnik allowed me to do is uh, then um, I could now have all that feedback in one place. And then instead of getting a thousand views, I got a hundred thousand views, you know? Um, but on the AdSense front, I, um, you know, now that I, you know, when I first got that thousand views or like, let's say I got 10,000 or something uh, p- hits or page views or whatever, um, uh, I, on the AdSense front, I got like a dollar because I didn't yeah. know how to monetize anything. I didn't have any track record of, you know, CPM or RPM. I don't know any of that. I was like, I think an ad would go here and that's it. That's, uh, how, how, please give me money, you know? <laughs> so, um, yeah, but based on that, I decided that, uh, you know, that's how I, I, I would learn how to get into the online space. And who was the first person in the online space that you'd seen make significant money from cars? Was it Doug Murrow? I don't think Doug DeMiro was really making much money. I mean, he was, uh, but I, I think when he when he left Jalopnik to pursue uh, pursue YouTube and also Auto Trader, and Auto Trader in the U.S. is different from what you have over here. So, so both of you guys were there, yeah. And that's that Jalopnik is now where, yeah. Oh, that's interesting. So, so it's 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 uh, it's fairly interesting, but um, I never I never thought people could make like actual money. I thought it was just like, oh well, maybe we can pay some bills or or whatever. Uh, but I I saw that you know some of the really top tier people they were they were getting you know like the Mr. Beast wasn't around back then, but I, I don't know who would have who would have been around like a Casey Neistat, PewDiePie, or something. Or something PewDiePie like right? Yeah. But PewDiePie never you know. Like you would talk, uh, they would talk about, oh yeah, PewDiePie made $10 million this year. And then he's just, he's streaming from his flat, you know, the, the whole, the whole day. And like, yeah, okay. I don't know. I don't, I don't know I what know that looks that's like. That's for me. Yeah. Yeah. But then you get, you have uh, all the people who like flaunt their wealth and, and whatnot. And you have Mr. Beast who, uh, you know, like, oh yeah, I gave away, you know, $4 billion in the, in the, this video. So, um, yeah, the, the, the money thing never really, ne- never really changed anything for me. Um, in terms of wanting to do YouTube, because I, I I never saw people actually make money from it. So, when did you realize then? So you mentioned you've been doing it for four to five years. Where was the moment you were like, "Oh, hang on a second, this YouTube thing, I can make a business out of that." And Steve, can you just put my phone on airplane mode, please? How dare you! Thank you. How dare you? Okay. Sorry. I thought this was a professional podcast fan. We've got him farting okay. over there. We've had you talking about feet pictures with clutches. And it's part of my story. <laughs> we got okay. Between bold Steve and only feet. This is mental. Yeah. So listen, listen. Okay. You asked, you asked me to come on here, you know, like I'm, this is, this is, you're getting it. You're getting it. Um, so, uh, what was the question again? I, I, um, when did you realize that you could actually oh, okay, make great. a living yeah. from YouTube? Um, I think after I bought Doug DeMuro's, uh, Aston Martin V8 Vantage. So I bought that car for $36,000 and then I made some, uh, some videos with it. And one of the videos did like 2 million views. 
And again, I didn't really know how to monetize things very well. So I probably didn't make many, you know, probably a hundred, few hundred bucks. But I remember thinking this is the first time I've ever had like millions of views on a video that I produced and people were like, it wasn't like some weird algorithm trick, you know, uh, I, I did have one video that I made a very, very long time ago. And it was, uh, like I edited together a bunch of clips from a, uh, a, a high speed chase. Uh, and it had a really interesting commentary because there was like a news, um, there's like a newscaster or something or two newscasters, uh, somewhere in some small town in America. And they were commenting on this thing. Yeah. yeah. And look at that. Absolute professional here. And they were, uh, they were commenting on it and it was like a Mustang chase and the commentary was really funny. And I just, uh, clipped it together. So it's, so it was uh, interesting to watch. And then that got a million views. And I thought, wow, that's a million views, but I can't, I can't replicate this. Like, I'm not going to be, this wasn't on you doing your own. No, stuff. no, no, this wasn't me doing it. But, but, uh, this thing with the Aston Martin, that was me, okay. was me doing my own stuff. Uh, so after that, I decided to like, all right, can I work on this car a little bit? You know, can I make it my own? I did, I did coilovers, exhaust, you know, that, that sort of thing. Um, you know, doing repairs on things, uh, buying project cars, and then slowly but surely it kind of snowballed into something. So uh, I, I bought a Lamborghini uh, Gallardo, a, uh, uh, a fire damaged twin turbo manual 08 Spider uh, from Copart. And, you know, that was my first like real big push because I sold my Aston Martin and I bought this Lambo. And uh, this was with like all the money I had. And I was like, this is a really big gamble because nobody had been doing exotic car rebuilds before. So, um, you know, I did that. And then I went from 150,000 subscribers to like 550 in the span of a few months. Um, and I was like, holy crap, this is this is awesome. And these videos, each video was getting, you know, back then, uh, like I would be over the moon if I got 100,000 views. Um, but, you know, these videos were getting 300, 400, 500,000. You know, some some were like in the millions. So I, I decided to be like, you know, I, I was like, this is going to be what I do. You know, like I, I can do this. I can replicate this. And each video was getting the same, you know, same amount of views. I'm like, OK, I can do this. I can um, see what people um, like about this and I can adapt. And, you know, I'm, so I'm, I'm capable sparking of sparking that business yes. thought of I actually need to put a bit of thought and a business plan behind this rather than just put this out there and hope the ad uh, sense pay us a little bit. Yeah. I don't, I don't know about all that. I don't know about the business plans. I've never made a business plan. If you're making a business plan for YouTube, dude, I don't, I, you need to find a different line of work. Um, but uh, I, I, I am, I am very interested in the analytics. Uh, I do like watching, you know, like I, I'm on YouTube studio all the time. I check it, you know, probably a hundred times a day, uh, which I probably shouldn't, but, uh, you know, it's, it's nice to know what the audience wants. Uh, make sure you know what your demographics are. Make sure you're actually um, delivering on what the people want to see from your channel. So you more bothered with things like watch time compared to subscribers gained? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Subscriber, so subscribers don't mean anything. It really doesn't. Um, the only thing that matters really is uh, click through rate and watch time because that's the likelihood of, um, you know, YouTube pushing your stuff out. And, and then, you know, it's basically if you have a good title and thumbnail and then you have, if you have good, con good content. So if you have all those three things, you'll have a successful video. And back then was all your revenue. say when you bought that Lamborghini just through YouTube pay AdSense revenue. Yeah. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. So there was no sponsor. So what, what does life look like now? What is the kind of the the split because it's, it's not just YouTube AdSense revenue right now. No, I think I think it's probably like forty to fifty percent YouTube ad uh, ad revenue, and then you have another forty percent um, with uh, sponsors. Uh, and this is like sponsors, whether it's um, you know like yearly annual sponsorships where they just have their uh, their stuff in the back of my shop, uh, or we have signage in the shop or something like that, or like I use their their like it's a mainstay in my in my um, uh, videos versus like a one time like hey guys I'm here to talk to you about uh, blah, blah blah you know so the that makes up forty percent and then the rest is like you know merch and stuff like that I haven't done any giveaways or raffles um, so it's uh, I'm planning on doing one uh, soon. Uh, because I know that that can be like a really good kind of like boost to, to income uh, and also gets people engaged. Uh, so, 
you know, based on how you you play that, sometimes people can think like, oh, you're scamming us or whatever. And uh, I want to make it so everything is like super, legit. super legit. And, you know, everything's very transparent. And uh, I want people to be happy with their product and stuff. So, you know, that's... Uh, I spoke to Matt Armstrong, who was in a kind of similar position in the UK uh, with the rebuilds and turning that into his income and business and subscribers taking off. And he he just said, you, bro, you, you can't believe how like up and down the income stream is on YouTube oh, yeah. for argument sense, like the ad, the ad sense revenue. You can't rely on it too much. That's why the no. sponsors are so important, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean the 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 income stream is is an interesting one because there there are it does ebb and flow within a certain parameter, like within let's say you know year over year. If you look at it extrapolated, it actually doesn't move that much. Um, you know, like you might go you know plus twenty percent, minus twenty percent, or something like that. Um, but if you're looking at it from like a month to month, then you're like, holy crap, you know, one, one month I made this much. And then another month I made, you know, four X this much. And like, I don't know what, like if the views are uh, fairly consistent is like, it could be like this month was when they they wanted to do a lot of ad spend in this, uh, this industry because a movie was coming out or in this month there was a, uh, you know, a political election or something like that. So it, it's, you, you know, it's, it's, um, not. It's not in your best interest to rely on AdSense. You definitely want to have sponsors, but uh, you also want to have sponsors that people actually care about. You want to have sponsors that are uh, are good for your brand because you can be like, oh, yeah, I'm going to do like, I don't know, uh, NFTs and cock rings or something. And like that's that's probably not a good long term strategy. Right. And that income that's coming in from all those methods. How many people does it actually take to run your channel? Uh, it's me. All the editing. Yeah. All the thumbnails. Yep. It's all you. It's all me. Oh, now that really does surprise me. <laughs> I was expecting, I don't know, I've got a social media guy for this or I've nah. got a... No, nah, I do everything. Does that just consume your life? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Wow, yep. I would say that is... <laughs> <laughs> so, is it really surprising though? Yeah, no, it is when you get to that level because when I when I spoke to other people that are... Yeah, like similar, I guess, subscriber bases, or mm -hmm. I suppose Misha was similar. Misha did a lot of stuff himself, but I, yeah. I spoke to other people. You know, if you look at if you look at Tim for say, me, I haven't had him on the podcast yet, but I'd like to. But I'm aware that he has quite a team behind him, like a, a manager, so, sort of. But he still does all his own editing. He's still like, you know, every time I go to a show where he's there, he's like, oh yeah, we have to go back to the hotel oh, okay. because I have to edit, and like he does everything, everything himself. I don't think he's just he's a machine, man. People don't realize that, like how much this stuff consumes people, right? Oh yeah, it's your well. it's your entire life. You're and the the, the problem is you, you don't know like you're never off. You know when when there's a normal uh, day job, you know you get in at nine, you leave at five, and then like everything else is like here's what your time is. This is your time. Your time starts at five when you get off of work or whenever you get home. And then you can do, you know, you can go watch Netflix. You can have, uh, you know, your, your own hobbies. You want to have a side business, whatever. But with YouTube, it's like, that's it. You're that's, that's your life. That's, that's your entire life is this. And you're never off. You're, uh, you know, I'm fielding emails, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, writing emails to sponsors and whatever at two in the morning or, or whenever I get them, um, you know, I'm trying to solve like, and plus, you know, for me, I have to fix the cars, you know, I have to like go and work yeah, on these the cars. Biz, yeah. Yeah. So I have to solve these problems. I'm like, Hey, how do I fix a P1? I don't know. You know, <laughs> so I got to figure that out. And then on top of that, you have to do all the business stuff. So, um, you have to do meetings and sometimes they're like, all right, we'll set up a zoom meeting and you're there for an hour and it never leads to anything, you know? So you have to deal with all that and then, uh, do in-person meetings and then, you know, podcasts, podcasts and, 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 <laughs> and meeting, meeting with people. Like, so it, it's, it's a lot, you know, it takes up a lot of your time, uh, traveling, you know, I've been traveling for the last two months. I've been, I don't know how many places i've been you know i've i've, I've been You've in been probably in, 20 uh, hotels the ring last night you were in yeah. amsterdam yeah it, yeah in amsterdam I, I've, I've been to uh you know london and belgium and france and, and all that like it's just there's there's a lot um so yeah it's just you you have this has to be what you're passionate about otherwise you just explode but what would that 19 year old lad that uploaded a cold start video of a nissan maxima what would he think if he could see a clip of what that's like now? Do you think he'd like the look of it? 
well, he would he would look at the garage full of supercars and he'd be like, hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, that, I got to do one what? way to tick off. Yeah, so absolutely. Cool. Yeah, yeah. And so, th- so this is this is a it's a dream for me, and I'm really uh, fortunate to to do this. I mean, there's plenty of people that would. Um, you know, kill for this opportunity. And I want to run with it. I'm going to do this till the wheels fall off, you know? So it's, it's, um, you know, I, I know that I have been, um, you know, enamored with the, the automotive journalism space and like the presenter space. And like, we all grew up with, uh, you know, top gear and, and whatnot. And I thought like, what, what, what's going to take to be that? And now, you know, I'm at this stage and I'm not saying I'm like, I'm, I'm there yet, but like, I'm at a stage where, you know, I could call a few people and like, we are like one step removed from talking to like Jeremy Clarkson or, or whoever, or like, you know, I could go and make a, make a call and then have like a Koenigsegg, you know, drive or something like it, it's like all these, all these experiences are now open to me in a way that I could never have imagined. So, um, you know, that's what, that's what YouTube has given me. That's what, uh, uh, you know, figuring out how an audience works, uh, has given me, you know, through Jalopnik and, you know, all my articles and, and whatnot. So, I mean, based on that, I think, yeah, you know, 19 year old would be, would be pretty happy. I think the reason that I was so surprised when you just said about yourself doing everything is because obviously I messaged you off the back of uh, the Matt episode and says, hey, can we do this? Like mm-hmm. when you're in the UK, sometimes not expecting much of a reply because of just the numbers, like how is it possible to write something that? And I think it's now that I'm sat here reflecting like, whoa, I, that there was that reply. And I know you reply to friends that have DM'd you and pretty much yeah. everybody. Yet you're doing all the editing mm-hmm. and all the rebuilding yeah. and all the thumbnails and all the strategy and all the rest of mm-hmm. it. Well, I have, uh, so uh, when, when I, when I do the rebuilds, um, I do have, uh, a, a friend Jack, uh, who helps me. He's a really good, uh, body guy. So yep. he has a, he's a background in, uh, in the, the body work field and, uh, my friend Rex, who is a, is a, an amazing detailer. And we all sort of do like different things. Uh, like if we have to, you know, hunker down and, and start to, to cram for SEMA, we're all going to be there at the, uh, you know, at the 11th hour, you know, putting stuff together. Um, but for the, for the most part, like I'm the one uh, solving all these problems and, uh, you know, getting this stuff together and I'm facilitating things and turning wrenches and and whatnot. And at the start of the year, you post a video saying you couldn't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. After what you've just said, apparently I lied. So I'm I'm still doing it. (laughs) (laughs) You are still doing it, but to be honest, after everything that you said, I could see why you could easily fall the other way and not be. Yeah. Because that's that's a lot. Why did you say that you didn't think you could do this anymore? So a few things happened uh, in in the last year. Or so uh, I uh, my marriage uh, ended, and that had a, a really pretty profound effect on on me. And like it was, it it changed my understanding of like mental health and like what I wanted in life. Uh, because for a very long time I wasn't happy, and I thought happiness, you know, as as stupid and as cliche as it sounds. I never thought happiness was uh, was part of the equation for me. I I was always like I could be content with the stuff that I've accomplished. I can be like, you know, like all right, well, we got that done. That was all right. Um but it just never felt like anything. Um but I never felt happy with who I was, what I've accomplished or like, you know, like I said before I have imposter syndrome where I don't feel like I deserve any of the stuff that I'm getting. Um so after, you know, after everything kind of went down, I, I realized that happiness was something that I should um, not necessarily chase, but but just have have a an idea and, and you know, uh, hold that in the back of my head is like, are you happy doing what you're doing? And um, what I noticed from that is like people can genuinely tell when you're having a bad day because you can phone in you know, a YouTube video when you're like when you're going through something and you go, oh, crap, I got to make this YouTube video and like. My life's falling apart. So, all right, guys. So we are going to do like people can see it. People can see that you're being phony. But if you're not, they can see that genuineness. And it's uh, it, it's quite it's quite a big thing when you're actually, you know, when you have a good home life, when you have, uh, you know, a, 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 a not chaotic uh, home life. And uh, then, you you know, that transfers into your work. So uh, when I said I can't do this anymore, it was just everything kind of like uh, crashing down for me. And I, I figured like I, I thought 
it's not fair for me to keep doing this and like and sort of phoning it in because I felt like I was coasting for a while, like uh, intellectually, creatively. And I just wasn't, I just felt, you know, depressed for a while. And then after, you know, after that, not after the video, but like after everything that happened to me last year, uh, then I just started. The video was the peak of the mountain. Yeah. yeah. The, the video was just like, I, I thought, I, I felt you like I needed to address this because it just wasn't, you know, I wanted to tell people what was going on because people would, were like, Hey, is everything okay? Cause you don't look good. You know, like you, you don't like there's something, wow. something, something off, you know? And I knew that something was off. Like I'm. But, you know, then when I finally realized it, then I was like, okay, well, here's, here's what I think. Here's what actually happened. So, yeah. And do you think based on that, that then uh, people hold people back in life? In, in what way? The, when you don't, you don't always realize what you're in until you're out. Oh yeah. I mean, listen, listen, it's like, um, you know, like if you're in an abusive relationship and I'm not saying that that's what, that's what happened to me, but like, if you're in an abusive relationship, it's hard to see that you know, how, it's hard to see the 10,000 foot view, you know, because you're like, well, you know, maybe that person, you know, they're having a bad day. Maybe they just took it out on me. I, it's not fair for me to do that. And then you're just like kind of pushing yourself down. Um, so yeah, it's like, it's like, you think uh, in, in my case, um, I was, I always thought uh, I need to do this because I need to provide for my family. I need, this is what I should be doing, you know, kind of as the man of the house, right? I want to have um, you know, I, I want to have a good home life. Uh, and a part of that is me providing things, me making sure everybody's taken care of. And once that's taken care of, then I can, you know, I can take care of myself. And then it just doesn't kind of work. It doesn't work like that because you need people around you to take, you know, to, to, to help you, you know, you know, build a, a mental state that's not, you know, unhealthy. And would you have understood or spoke about say mental health as you just have done now, if you hadn't have actually gone through something, I I would, but I, it wouldn't have come from a place where you understood. You, you, where I understood anything. I mean, uh, you know, before and and I'm sure, like I am not an expert in anything, m least of which is mental health. There there are plenty of people. Listen, if you have some issues with mental health, talk to somebody. You know, uh, get some help. Talk to a therapist. That's great. You know, I I'm I'm always I always advocate for that. I'm fine with that. Um, but I'm just saying like stuff from my experience, you know, so my experience is that, um, it's always better to, you know, it's, it's fine to be vulnerable with people. Um, because it's, uh, I, I, I see that, you know, it can be a really good way to, uh, regulate your emotions and make sense of things. Like, cause if you're having, if you're going through something, sometimes you don't know the right, what's the right way to feel about this. Um, so it's always good to talk to people. Uh, and then, you know, sharing my experience allowed a lot of other people to be like, Hey, I'm going through something similar too. And, uh, you know, it's, it's good, it's good to know that you're not alone. Uh, sometimes you get, uh, you know, support from people and sometimes you can give support to people because, uh, one of the things that I learned was that, um, now I'm much more conscious of like, if somebody's feeling a certain way, I go, I just reach out to them. And it might be a person that I don't really know. Like it might be a person I DM on Instagram and I'd be like, Hey, you, do you want to talk? Do you want to like, you know, if you want to vent, feel free. I, I'm, I'm, I'll listen to whatever you have to say, you know, and that, that in itself, like helps so many people like, cause it's like, oh, I have a person that like, we'll just talk. And sometimes people do talk and then you can, you know, you don't, you don't judge them. You don't say anything like that, but like you, um, you just listen to their experience. And sometimes that's enough. So did the aftermath of you posting that video we're like nine months down the road now, mm -hmm. Did that overwhelm you in any sense? What was what was that like? like well, it went trending, that? which was which was fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which was which is weird. It was like, hey, I had this I had this thing where I talked about this uh, you know deeply emotional uh, you know uh, mental episode that I had, and, 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 thought, and, I and then I was like, oh yeah, it's a, uh, like trending on YouTube. Was like, great. <laughs> and then yeah, no, it, it was it was good. I mean, I got uh, listen, I got tons of support. It was overwhelmingly positive. Um, I don't think I had any, any negative, um, comments, at least I didn't, you know, look at them, but, um, yeah, it, it, uh, it just kind of opened my eyes to how many people are sort of suffering in silence and they don't have to be. Uh, that's really what, what, 
what back then, what project were you doing alongside all that happening? What did, what was your head stuck into to try, uh, to try and keep you focused on something while everything was going? Through? So we were just, I, I, I don't know. This was after SEMA and like after SEMA, which is a big car show in Las Vegas and it takes place in November. I'm very much considering. You should go. You should absolutely go. It's fun. But uh, we just finished SEMA and, you know, we just got past the November, December, you know, high ad rate you know season where every youtuber is like scrambling to put out as many videos as possible i don't think i put out that many videos and i don't think they were very good i can't even remember what they were to be honest with you um so it might have been i think we were doing a car track or something back then and um then i i put out this video and then like that's when i started uh, i think i just bought the p1 um but i i, ha I wasn't going to release it until you know, like three months from then. This is what baffles me with you guys. Because yeah. Matt was the first person that I kind of learned this from. I was like, what? It was like, just how many cars sometimes you guys have got tucked under your sleeves away oh, that yeah. don't come out to the front. Yeah. Um, mad. And um, what, but we, of course, we're going to get onto the, the P1, but we, I try and like almost try and tell a story so people get the full picture. Mm -hmm. So we started with that five, six years ago, the Aston Martin. Yeah. I mean, I, before, before that I had like a, like a Mercedes S 500 and whatever. Yeah. So the, how many projects? Cause if you, if you go onto the Google search bar, YouTube search bar, sorry, and put mm -hmm. in Tavarish, one of the first search terms that comes up is Tavarish McLaren P1 yeah. build. Um, and obviously that's been a really six, it's not even finished yet. And yet it's yeah, it's been a hugely successful gain. It looks mm -hmm. like from the outside in terms of subscribers and all the rest of it. Yeah. But do you want to just give us like a quick run over of what cars have happened up to that point? Okay. I could talk about the, the big ones. So I had the Lamborghini Gallardo Spider. Uh, then I had a 2003 Lamborghini Murcielago that was in Fast and Furious 8. It was a movie car. So we uh, totally, um, totally rebuilt and, uh, and restored that. And then that went to uh, Peterson Automotive Museum for a few years. Uh, and then I had a McLaren 675LT that uh, was crash damaged That's and had, lot. yeah. So that that was, uh, we rebuilt that in like two years. Uh, in the middle, I mean, I've had, you know, Ferrari 430 Scuderia. Um, what else? Uh, did a, a Yugo GV. Uh, there was- What is that? A Yugo GV, it's a, it's a, it's a Yugoslavian car. Um, and uh, Yugoslavia is a country that doesn't exist anymore, but uh, it's uh, it was a very it's 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 widely known uh, at least in America as like the worst car ever made. Uh, so I bought one, and it's based on like a Fiat one two four or one two six or something like that. It has like a Fiat engine, has a one point one liter Fiat engine, and uh, I essentially hot rotted mine, so I got a one point five liter big block, and uh, then we you know put in like a performance cam, like the thing revved to like nine grand, and it made it made a really good noise. It was carbureted, uh, but uh, yeah, just just a crappy car. I spent way too much money on it. Got coilovers, and it's stupid. Um, but then, uh, yeah, a bunch of other stuff um, that I've done in the interim, um, like little bits and pieces. Have you, have you sold many of these pieces? Not You've really. got them all? No. Nah, I mean, mo most of them I keep. Because in the States, they, they you seem to have quite a different attitude to modified cars than what mm -hmm. the UK does. The UK is like, if you put something on Auto Trader, even if it's got like a different set of wheels on it, like a Novatech wheels and a little Novatech wing or like a 488 or something mm -hmm. like that. In the UK, people would be scrolling down Auto Trader and they'll be like, yeah, no, nah, I'm not touching that. That that to them is like crash damage. Well, yeah, but but that's it that's seems, also because your insur seems. your insurance stuff is weird. Like it's it's like you have to you have to name off all the modifications you have to a car before you get insurance on it. Think of what the van was like. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Like how do you insure this? Like, well, we it's it's a podcasting studio, and they have to explain to them what a podcast. I just is. said it was a motorhome. It's a motor. <laughs> there there, there we go. Like, how many beds does it have? No, you know. <laughs> so it, it's yeah. Um, in America, it's a little different because uh, I think America has more of a, um, you know, individualistic uh, attitude towards cars. So like your car is an extension of yourself. And that's you can take that to its, uh, you know, its extremes where, you know, people's entire personality is their, you know, Chevy Camaro or Ford Mustang or something. Or three generations handed down. I, I, exactly. Yeah. It's like my daddy had a Ford Mustang and I got a Ford, you know, but like with with the UK, I think it's all a bit like you, you guys are a little newer to the modification scene. Oh, yeah. So you're like dipping your toes like maybe I get an exhaust. Maybe I get a wrap. Maybe I do this. And but like. To, to be fair, I'll, I'll give you a prime example. I've got, um, I'm very fortunate enough to have an 812, as we said before, 
I've only had it a week, but I'm thinking about doing an exhaust. But the way I'd say that most car owners over here, minds work with that is like, I'm like, if I change this small piece of X pipe in the middle of the exhaust, I'm going to void the warranty. Oh no. <laughs> and it's like that. And then I just start stressing and it's like, Ugh. so the, the thing I, I, never understood was the warranty thing and like you're gonna harm the resale value there are people that told me when i got this p1 they're like oh don't don't change it when you rebuild it you rebuild it back to stock because then you're gonna harm the resale value i'm like the fucking flood did that <laughs> I'm like what do you think this, do you don't think it was underwater like what do you think that did to the value do you don't think it's car vertical history had done that yeah yeah I, I feel like you look at his car vertical history like uh what happened here like it was uh okay so this uh 100 million tiktok views of this thing underwater i was like yeah it's it's mint it's mint i swear it's mint yeah but it's blue now <laughs> yeah it's blue now yeah yeah no like oh no it's it's not its original color no like that that's that's so stupid like the the warranty thing i understand if you're not uh, if you don't have a mechanical background and there's stuff that you're like, oh, well, I can't, it's a brand new Ferrari. So I can't, I can't solve this stuff with, you know, like some hand tools. You need like a, a Ferrari diagnostic and stuff. Um, but for me, I mean, I never, I've never cared about the warranty. I always, I always thought of like, if this car breaks, that's just another problem that I can solve. Like there's nothing that McLaren has that I need. There's nothing. But, okay. I don't think this is right. But do you think that because the builds will affect your business, so you can just, just the more crazy you make these things, the the more whistling diesel catches fire to an F8 Tributo slid mm -hmm. sideways through a cornfield, yeah. the more money he'll make. And that is the, the the crazy world that we live in. Do you think if you were an owner separated from the business side of it with the cars, you'd think any differently? Or do you just think in America and potentially the modified scene, you just go, fuck it, let's make it nuts? No, of course. Well, well here's, here's, the, here's the issue. If I buy a P1, like if I bought that P, the, the same P1 you that I have. You did buy a P1. I, I know, <laughs> but if I bought a nice one, like if I bought a good one, and it was uh, one and a half, two million dollars, right? Everything I do to that car from that, point, uh, that moment that I buy it is making it worse. Every time I sit in it, every time I drive it, every time I fart in the seat, uh, you know, like it's just make it just film lessening. Film videos with your feet. Yeah, exactly. Film videos with my feet. Uh, it, it's just making the, uh, it's lowering the value, the potential value for another buyer because, ooh, I need that resale value. Oh my God. Um, but right now when I buy the car, crappy. Everything I do from now on, every morsel of sand that I take out is making the car better. So there's nothing I can do. If I put that car through a, a, a wood chipper, it would still be better than than what I got it uh, what I got it as. So it's just like I can make the car whatever I want. And the way I I, I think about it is like let's let's uh, make the car as if it came out of the McLaren factory, but like in, in my head, like if McLaren Skunk Works got to it, like if it was like a, a very special edition of this car. And I try to do a lot of theming with my builds, like my 675 LT, I themed it after, um, you know, the McLaren F1 that uh, that we, you know, got to drive. And, you know, I love that car so much, but it's $20 million car. I can't afford that. I don't think I'll ever be able to afford it. Yet. So, yeah, I mean, I don't, I really don't think I'll ever be able to afford it. Um, and much less have a $20 million car. You know, let's say I, I afford that. I'm not going to drive it on the road with like a $500 piece of crap next to it with no insurance. And then he just it smacks the, the bumper or something. What, what happens then? Um, but... So I, I themed my 675. I themed the uh, the Lamborghini uh, Murcielago and and everything else. Like I want everything to be like a whole thing. Like it feels an extension feels of your personality as of well. My personality, but it also feels complete and it feels clean. You know, it feels like a clean build. There's a lot of people that will put a bunch of car like a bunch of stuff on a, on a car and then just like call it a build. Um, I remember the one thing that a girl told me when I was like 19 when I had uh, a Nissan Maxima. Nissan Maxima. When I had a Nissan Maxima, yeah. Uh, I was driving her home and she goes, your car is like a big collection of parts. And I'm like, I, I took, I took real offense to that. And I'm like, how could she say that? Because I have a screen and I have gauges and I have all this stuff. Like, yeah, but it's not cohesive at all. You know, it's just like, I found this for a good deal. I got this for a good deal. These things happened, you know, uh, 10 months uh, in, in between. And, uh, you know, I, I have an exhaust that doesn't sound like that. Like it, it just... It, it there was no theme to it and now i'm all about theming and uh i'm all about uh you know having a car be like uh, the, like the build is 
it's complete. You know, it's it's a it's a it's a whole complete car. If that makes any sense, and I don't know if I answered your question. So, so the reason uh, that I brought up the previous cars was because we just spoke that if we you YouTube your name, you'll see the P1 thing come up. Do you ever get as cool as the build has been? And as you mentioned, you launched it at the beginning of the year, and we're now nine months down the road in several videos, etc. Is there any part of you that when you go to these shows, you think, oh, fuck, just ask me about one other car other than the P1? No, no, no? absolutely not. No, no. Because, um, you know, when people come up to me, they say, how's a P1? How's a P1? How's a P1? But the reason why people are watching me and why I'm going to a different country and people know who I am is because of that car. So, like, absolutely. I, I want I want them to ask me as many questions as they want. You know, that it's a, it's a part of – it's sort of part of the social contract that, like, I get to do this and share it with people and then also make a living off of it. But at the, on the flip side, like, I want – I want them to ask me, you know, if, if we're in a situation where, you know, we're on a one-on-one -on -one conversation, like I want them to get as much as they can out of it too. Checking the cameras. Yeah, yeah that was recorded. I, okay. I thought that that's what the guy's there for. Look, the, he's that's just, what the guy's he's there. Just my bold friend. <laughs> <laughs> can you? Okay, so can you tell him like, if you see a big red flashing X, like, can you just be like, <laughs> the screen goes like, off. the screen goes off? No, I'm listening to the podcast. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> He's got the live seat. He paid for this. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I you, like, first you guys are getting paid. <laughs> for this? Do, you want, do you wonder how much how I get my income for the van? It's oh, twice I charge a live seat. I thought it was from your feet, dude. Like you've been. Yeah, like, uh, uh, no, you're in a different industry to me, man. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. But the the P1 build. Okay. Has McLaren helped you at all with this? No. Well, uh, so McLaren. Because they were dicks to me. McLaren proper. Uh, like the the corporation or McLaren Automotive uh, has been completely radio silent. Mm -hmm. And I wager that this is what's going to happen. After I get the car done and it does a bunch of press and, uh, you know, stuff, they're going to be like, hey, we're really happy that you did this and we've been rooting for you all along and, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, but right now, I think I'm dead to them because, you know, I'm just some idiot uh, – you know, rebuilding this, this, uh, you know, flagship hypercar in his garage, you know, so it doesn't, it's not going to matter to them. They, they can't really make any money off of anything. And you mentioned, cause you had the six, seven, five and only got the P1 and they're flipping epic cars. Mm -hmm. As you said, you got no support from the actual company. Cause what infuriates me is I love McLaren racing, like formula one and all the rest mm -hmm. of it, but I had a five seventy that just shit itself. What happened with it? Oh, what didn't happen with it? Um, changed down in second gear into a corner turned all the windows shattered um so there must have been some sort of flex the <laughs> throttle was that the, the i think the turbo spool was delayed so i remember i was going up an alpine pass i hit the brake turn into one of the hairpins then went to accelerate up the next bit towards the curb hit the throttle nothing happened I was like, and as i took my foot off it to go back over to the brakes i was kind of approaching the hairpin it just accelerated forwards towards the barrier and it was almost like the, the turbo was delayed and then i mean the the roof didn't work several days the parking brake it was it was chaos but it wasn't the car braking mm -hmm. and i'm sorry to go off topic and this isn't for any of this bit guys no we're but, talking about mclaren this is very relevant the it wasn't the car braking that pissed me off what pissed me off was the week before I went with uh, like our car group to the factory and we're stood with the head of VIP sales and I'm not going to say his name because but I really want to and he was what does his name rhyme with <laughs> fart ass so <laughs> we were looking over the entire building and he said to me there is my card if you ever have a problem with your car on that rally because I think you won't give me a ring next yeah. week and I will sort it out uh -huh. and I phoned that whole week after 28 volts and I never got a single thing the dealership it was uh, Ryber at Bristol were absolutely incredible. The brand was awful. Yeah. And that was my experience as a customer. And that's why I'd never buy one again. So what's interesting because uh, I've had a really good experience with a uh, dealership um, in the States. So McLaren Orlando, they were like, we really like what you're doing. Bring our P1, uh, bring your P1 over. We'll have our P1 tech look at it and tell you what he thinks. And then if you need any, any help with anything, we'll be, you know, we can get you parts. I mean, like this is parts at retail cost. So it's not like, you know, th this is still very, very expensive, but like you can still get stuff if you need. Um, and they're, they've been fantastic. They, they've, uh, you know, they've literally been rooting for me since the beginning. Uh, but McLaren, the brand that's different. Um, because then they don't, they don't care. Like they're just, you know, I've, I've reached out. They're like, uh, I think I was supposed to go to one of their launches, like a 750 S launch or something. And they're like, yeah, we're not gonna, 
we're not gonna have him there so you know again this is all like friend of a friend type thing is like yeah they, they don't they don't want you it there. just makes these brands though more corporate and more detached from just like car people oh yeah for and, sure. and if there was a brand i think this is why some of the, the brands like conan zag and all the rest of it gets such a good following as uh, because it's actual people. people yeah yeah yeah. it's yeah. actual people talking normally yes and like having a bit of a laugh or you might swear on camera rather than how it's become with these kind of clinical brands like everyone's yeah. afraid afraid to say anything about mm -hmm. ferrari now because they're like i get sued <laughs> yeah <laughs> like, has ferrari sued anybody like who's who's ferrari sued it all started with that ferrari didn't it i think that's it that's all that's all it did well maybe, maybe the the fear is outweighing yeah but i, I think i think I, I honestly think ferrari I, has ferrari fr like frivolously sued anybody have, have you done a ferrari yeah yeah you did, yeah, the, Scud, yeah. You did the full yeah, I did the, the scuderia yeah you yeah. didn't have any fears of oh, no I'm absolutely not why would why would ferrari give any any sort of a shit about you know like some old 430 that was that was crashed and I'm rebuilding it and I'm changing the color. Why would they care? Because someone somewhere once got that, I suppose. I thought, no, I don't no, no, no. So, so that I, I think, uh, let, let's, let's dispel that myth now. I don't think Ferrari fraudulent, like frivolously sues people, uh, at least not to the degree that people think they, they might've done it in the past. Or I remember that, uh, Ferrari sued one guy. Uh, he was a, um, a designer and he put some shoes or something. I think they were like green shoes. Somebody can, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but they put uh, some shoes next to like a, a matching Ferrari color. Uh, and then they had the Ferrari logo in the, in the in the advertisement. And then Ferrari sued him. They were like, we're not associated with your brand. And then he, he didn't want to take it down. So he got sued. You know, they gave him a cease and desist and they didn't want to take it down. So like that's... Yeah. I feel like that's totally justified, you know, uh, the Ferrari thing. I'm not sure about like the, the dead mouse thing where he replaced all the badges and whatever. And they were like, well, we don't want people to think like, yeah, that's, that's a little stupid, but like, I don't, yeah. Ferrari's not going to give a crap about you. Hopefully you know. McLaren won't about this video as well, because really McLaren doesn't have any money to, to do no, anything. So, true, so yeah. like, I'm not worried about anything. What's really yeah. annoying is there's so many car people out there that want them to do really well. Mm -hmm. at the minute as, as a brand and they are struggling i believe to sell new car units these days i think mclaren is uh, it needs to um i'm gonna name drop uh because uh you know i can uh, well, well, yeah <laughs> uh so me and jay leno are are uh are uh agreed on this um yeah i'm just name drop that right there uh i i think they need to to build something like an SUV like the Ferrari Puro Sangue or or the Lamborghini Urus or whatever, they need to build some sort of mass market cash thing, cow. cash cow, so they can keep their their business running because the Artura is garbage. The Artura is like it drives great, reliability is terrible. It's it's awful. Uh, they're, they're, they they fumble the launch like twice. Uh, customer cars are coming back with with insane uh, problems. And I, even the cars they give out to, to reviewers, which are like, you know, usually pre-production cars, they're all, they're all breaking, you it's know, like the flood damaged P1. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, I, I, I made a post, uh, somebody posted something about, uh, like an Artura, uh, during the, um, the LA, like LA got hit by a tropical storm and there was some flooding and there was a video of a, uh, an Artura just like in some floodwaters. It wasn't high. It was like basically up to like half the wheel or something. And, uh, you know, everybody was tagging me because it's a McLaren in a flood. And, um, and then I was like that Artura is going to have the exact um, exact same amount of uh, electrical issues exactly. after the flood as before the flood. You know, like yeah. <laughs> it's like same amount. So <sighs> it's such a shame. I really want them to sort it out. It's, it's actually strange because I've, I've been pissed off with the brand before, but mm -hmm. deep down, everyone that's pissed off, just like, yo, especially being English, it's like, I want this brand to do well. Like, sort yourselves out. The cars please. are the, so the cars are fantastic. Yeah, they are. They they look like spaceships on the road. They drive like nothing else. They they sound great. Um, which is why you've also done two of them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I love, I love the, my favorite car is a McLaren F1. That's like, that's my money, no object dream car. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just something where I, I don't, I understand that there's really big problems with the brand and at le le least problems that I have with the brand. I'm sure other people are be like, I've had a exemplary, you know, <laughs> like my, my, <laughs> my experience with the brand has been fantastic. I've, there's no issues. Like, I don't, I don't know who can say that, but like maybe they're out there. Um, but it's just, I, I want, I want them to succeed because they make such really, really cool stuff. Yeah. The, the one drive I had in that 570S one night, just before I took it away and it shit itself, 
was fantastic but it's, yeah. it's not even just like the power or the speed of it it's just like it's everything the mm-hmm. steering the gearbox it's phenomenal and that's their that's their entry level car yeah it's not- that's that's the that's the smaller one you know and then you get to the 720 and then like imagine how good like a senna is or a senna gtr is like you know it's that just way more engaging you know have you actually driven an apologies maybe i should have done some more research but have you actually driven a okay p1 no i've never driven a p1. you've never so you've never no. so you're rebuilding this thing not actually knowing what it's going to be like on no, your first drive uh, b- because and i do this i i had the opportunity i mean i've been very fortunate but I ha- i've had the opportunity to drive a few p1s um and i always turned them down because i was like i want my p1 to be my first uh you know opportunity uh because then when i i drive another one i'd be like Oh, I missed a mark on this. Like, I, it's like I've, I've totally, I've totally screwed this up. Uh, no, I just want mine to be, you know, the special, you know, I, I, I want that to be in my head as like what a P1 should be, you know? How big of a kind of monumental decision was it to purchase something of that value as like the next stage in your YouTube channel? So no one's ever done an, anything necessarily with a hypercar mm-hmm. rebuild. That is, that is the first, you're pioneering it. So when, when you actually kind of sent the money yeah and then this car arrived oh no i went to go pick it up okay yeah 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 what was that what was that like for you was there any moment of like oh shit yeah well mainly because i didn't have the money to do that um i had to get a loan for that amount of money uh and then i told the bank exactly what i was going to do with that money um i told them hey there's this car that's that's been floating down the street and uh, i want to buy it and it doesn't run and it's very expensive and uh, i make i have a youtube channel where i make videos and they were like Here's six hundred thousand dollars, and I was like, "That's that seems like a bad idea for you, but thank you very much." So I bought the car. Uh, I never really thought. I always thought um, I can, if worse comes to worse, I can sell this car, and then I'll lose some money, but I won't lose all of it, you know. And like, I'll at least make a, some cool videos out of it. If if I get this and I go there's no way I can ever rebuild this car. And then I just kind of wash my hands of it. Like at least I have a bunch of parts I can sell. I can, I can make this furniture for some dude in Dubai, you know, like it doesn't, I, I'm not going to be out, you know, 600 grand. And at least I know that I did everything I could to rebuild that car, you know? Um, but it never occurs to me that like, Oh, I can go bankrupt or something like that because I never really think of it in terms like that. And do you think that's just because of the upwards trend that you've been on with the channel? No, because I, I didn't really have an upwards trend before the P1. Um, it was just kind of like maintaining a bit. And then, um, yeah, I just thought that I, I knew I knew that story was very important. And this car had the story. Like, it had the best story that uh, that any, you know, damaged car had in the world. Like everybody the, saw and and it, was, it, it was still relevant because it just happened a few months ago. So everybody saw it die on, on, you know, uh, on Twitter and TikTok and Instagram. And like, that's the one that they saw like, oh my God, that's $2 million car. Like, why don't you keep it in the garage? I wouldn't have parked it outside if she was my girlfriend. Because it you smashed know? through the door of the garage. It we did. Yeah. Yeah. Before. He had it in the garage. I only saw the video of it in the garage. And then I saw a video of it going down the street. Yeah. He didn't, he didn't take it out and park it and be like, I right. was thinking, is this just like, I really want it broken. Yeah, yeah, like, like, it's not broken. It's not broken enough. It turns out it still starts. The yeah. door just accidentally comes uh-huh. up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh no, no, uh, the the floodwaters rushed in, the garage door was broken down. Um I mean the car has quite a bit of damage from going through the garage door. Uh so that's fun. And then it just floated 500 yards on the street. So yeah, it's uh and then you bought it off Copart. And then I bought it off Copart cuz I'm a smart person. And how close are you to finishing that build? I am Listen, man, we're just having a good time here. I don't, I don't, I don't know, you know, like bringing up all this negativity here. Because it's got to be ready for a month and a half. It seems it, do, right? it does. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to sleep for another month. So we're, we'll we'll get it done. stressed. You, you know, so I am, I, I work well with stress. If I have stress, if I have a deadline that's looming, like uh, a lot of people think I procrastinate, and I absolutely do. But it's something that I. Uh, you know, that's when I work best. Uh, the problem is the stress that you can't deal with. Like, I don't know. Um, you just have like one of your, um, like a significant other has like some inoperable brain tumor or something. And that just gives you stress. And like, there's nothing you can do about it. But if it's something like a YouTube video or like a car that that, like, I can do something about this. Like we can finish this build. All it's going to take is effort from me and 
if that's all it is, I can do that. That's fine. We can, I can rally the troops. I can not sleep. I can, uh, you know, I can cram as much as I can and we'll get it done. So that, that's stuff that I'm super on board with. And have you always been like that? Or do you think from say huge moments happening in life for argument's sake, like what happened at the start of the year, do you think those have shaped you to now just not sweat the small stuff? Or no, I, I think I've always kind of. I, I think I've you? always been like that. I've always been um, the person that never studies and then uh, goes and gets a good grade on a test because I can. I have a good, you know, uh, short term memory, and I just, I just cram for an hour before the the class. You know, like that. That's that's what I can do. Um, and in the eleventh hour, that's when things usually come together. And I've done this. You know, a few times. And when I say I, I mean like me and 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 other people that, that work with me and, uh, you know, Jack and Rex and stuff. So I don't want to leave them out of it. But, uh, you know, I, I, I can put things together pretty quickly and they're usually fairly good. Where'd you go from a McLaren P1? Space shuttle. <laughs> yeah. I, I heard they, they decommissioned some and, you know, they, uh, yeah, I feel like we can put some rocket boosters on there, you know, put, put an LS in it. Because you mentioned you, 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 if you're working in YouTube, you shouldn't go and move to a business plan or pursue a business plan but i didn't if, say you shouldn't it, i i just i just said it's it seems like a little it's it's a little silly in my mind uh to do that i'm sure that you could do that and that's probably a smart way to go um so do you have though the next build on your mind i yeah i i know i i know roughly what i'm going to do but i so it doesn't it's not like bigger and better like because if you go all right well you know this is a p1 then i have to do what like a koenigsegg or a pagani or whatever the next thing like you can't these these things don't exist anymore, you know. Like, like, the, like for argument's sake, the Pagani that crashed. Exactly. Like you'd, you'd have strong. to get that, but like that's you know the, the starting price of that is five million dollars. Like at what point do you just go like why am I why am I doing this? Like, go back to the bank, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like hey, can you give me ten times more money, please? Um, no, like I I wouldn't. Uh, you don't want to do that. But what people want to see, especially in my in my field, is that uh, you have a challenge ahead of you. And that's why Matt Armstrong's really good because it doesn't matter what car he gets. Like the, the cars he gets are interesting because it's interesting for him because he likes those cars. You can tell he's passionate about it. Um, but uh, it, it's just because they present a challenge like this 720S that he got like, oh, there's carbon damage. He's never done carbon damage before. So how do you how do you fix this? Or like the Ferrari is like, well, the Ferrari came in a million pieces. He's never done a Ferrari before. So how do you do that? So it's like that's that's what that's what it all that's what it's all about. Uh, with the P1, it's like I've I've done a McLaren before, but this is like a, a different league altogether. So what do you do there? So my next build would probably be something. It's probably not going to be a, a hypercar that's worth two million bucks, but it's uh, it's going to be something where you go. I don't see how you could ever rebuild that. I don't see how you can make a working car out of that. But I'm going to see him try to do this because he has a track record of doing this. Do you think if you ever got to the point where you couldn't find the right work-life balance and you were still editing everything, doing most of the stuff. Mm -hmm. Do you think you'd be prepared to start delegating and letting it go to other people and building a team with the risk of you losing your slight touch of how you like it done sure. to have a better family life? Yeah, I, I think so too. So the work-life balance thing is always, you know, it's a sliding scale. It's, it's never like, well, I end my work here. And then that's when it, like, I, I'm not, I'm not that kind of guy because there's a, a lot of things that can come up. Um, you know, builds take time or, you know, there's sometimes things run long or sometimes I'll have more time in the day where I go, okay, I'm just going to spend time with my family. Um, but, uh, delegating things is, is fine. Uh, I'm actually, uh, going to hire somebody to, uh, do some of the camera work. So, you know, it'll be more of a third person view instead of like a first person with, with me, you know, on the wrong end of the, of the mic. Um, the editing, I can, I can do that for, uh, you know, I can give that responsibility to somebody, uh, maybe, but it's just vetting that person is going to take some time and showing them, uh, you know, what the, what the vision is. Uh, one thing I'm not really a fan of is a bunch of notes passes. So, you know, somebody brings out an edited video and then they go, you know, and then you go, okay, now I have to write comprehensive notes for this. And then they bring it back to you and they go, okay, well, I'm not happy with this. So like, how do you, 
you know, like let, let's let's like I'm I'm not a I'm not a big fan of that because I feel like I, I need to lean on somebody and give and them then, that creative direction. Yeah, yeah, a creative direction. But then, am I stifling them? Do they have better ideas than I do? I don't know because that that could be a that's that could a be really a thing. big thing. Yeah, so like it's possible that they have better ideas than I do, but like I might not want to go in that direction. Um, or like I think that like on a technical level, they're not as as good as they think they are, and like and then there's like interpersonal dynamics there and then like am i gonna hurt their feelings if i say that that i don't like this so i like you know there's so much there so i'm like i'd rather not deal with it and plus i actually like the i like the process of editing it just takes it takes a long time but i like putting a story together i like going like this is a video i i am you know i'm proud of i hope people watch it um there's a bunch of times where i go i don't really like this video but like i think i think people will like it and then you know it turns out people like it so it's like you might just be you know, beating yourself up for no reason. As you said, it doesn't always have to be about the next biggest build because you obviously uh, got to know Matt a lot better because he actually came over to the US to rebuild a car. Yes. So could you ever see yourself coming over here to rebuild? Yeah, absolutely. I've been, I've been here four times this year. Yeah, absolutely. I got four cars here. Yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think you've been amazingly open uh, as we bring this to a close. Just want to say thank you so much for coming on the podcast, telling mm -hmm. your story and telling your road to success i think it's an amazing achievement what you've accomplished and i look forward to hopefully seeing before sema when i come because i'm gonna just, i'm commit gonna commit now i'm gonna come to good. vegas good maybe you're gonna look after me you'll show yeah. me where to go yeah come to see and, and if you don't come to see me you're just gonna cut this aren't you <laughs> yeah it's <laughs> just gonna cut this right <laughs> out okay, of the podcast get, get off this look at the prices little yeah like, oh my god i'm not going i'm not going i can't afford this Fuck. yeah <laughs> <laughs> i'm into way too deep with this yeah, man yeah. um but i thought it'd be fun just to bring in uh this is my friend steve so steve come in uh, to the episode he's been on the the mic the entire well behind the scenes the entire time and sit down because Hello, we, mate, all right? we've actually got if you took up tights we're both in view we've actually got oh, you some guys are questions adorable. we've got <laughs> a eclectic friendship group mix on our snapchat group eclectic friendship group mix yes. that's uh, that sounds like okay some special sounds like ones. A, it sounds like, <laughs> a, it sounds like a good way to say on the spectrum yeah yeah we're all on different colors <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> i like green the ginger one <laughs> yes yeah exactly yeah um but we've got some some questions haven't we what has aiden asked um because we think that this may replicate maybe some questions that you you get asked from your own people on the subscriber base or things that they want okay. to ask. So do you want to play to the mic what Aiden? Are we asked? ready? I'm ready. Hello, Tavarish. Uh, I would like your opinion on bowler wheels, please. Keep the good work. Love your stuff. So what, what, that was what, one of them on the colours. What um, is what is what is a what is a bowler wheel? Is that is that bowler or like bowler? Do you want to show? A bowler, a bowler with a B, not an E. So it's okay. slightly less of a disease. Mm -hmm. Bowler wheel. Do you want to get a photo? Which one, though? Oh, sorry, I do apologize. <laughs> I haven't ever been on a podcast before. <laughs> so, uh, but should we gonna, yeah, get oh, a, this, our friend's car. Oh. So, uh, because he, sw he swapped them. But in, okay. in, the, U in the UK, there's a show called Gravity. Um, yeah, I know what I Gravity is, I had yeah. the owner, Jordan, on the podcast. Really yeah. cool to talk about his story. Mm -hmm. And um, he selects what cars should be on display at, say, that show. And this was... We're not we're not car shaming anybody, by the way. We're just having a little bit of fun. But this was our friend's wheels. And I don't understand at all. I thought they were perfectly nice. So those look like TE37s. Correct. Yeah, but, but, but they're, not. they're not. So yeah. they're reps. Yeah. So, so it, yeah. Basically, you, you get too close and they start to melt just a little bit like chocolate. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so they're they're reps of of Goodwill. Don't get don't get rep wheels. Basically, they just don't don't do that, that. That's the answer to everything. Yeah. But that, he's to world hunger as well. He's not. <laughs> to world, the answer to that, world what, hunger is don't get rep wheels. Get yeah, yeah. 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 Just don't get rep wheels. Full stop. Okay. Yeah. That's a great way to end this podcast. But he, Thank he, you. he doesn't have bowlers anymore he has swapped them but you're yeah. right this is a great way to end the podcast really thank you so absolutely. much absolutely thank you on. so much man. pleasure to meet you awesome and, uh, we look forward to seeing you again in the next episodes please subscribe <laughs> if you, you haven't you already much. i'll catch you again <laughs> soon bye <laughs> Many channels out there end up launching merch stores, but normally these are cheap, low quality items with someone else's logo on you don't even want. For Road to Success, we try to think outside the van. Therefore, we're gonna be turning our favorite sayings from our most popular guests into quotes that you can buy as motivational artwork that comes framed, ready to hang on your wall in your space. You can choose to shop via 
business or sport categories or just by your favourite guest. Go and check out our new store at www.roadsuccessstore.com or find the links in bios and descriptions. Let's win together.